Good morning. This is Sunday, July 8, and we're in episode or chapter or or whatever, 49 of uh, Commandments of the New Testament. And uh, this is going to be concerning your works, uh, the uh, Commandments concerning your works, uh, episode number five. Uh, as last time we got together, I think we, we went over this. Uh, there's a time, and I, I got this from the internet, uh, which indicates that there are, are a lot of other people who are beginning to become disenchanted with the church's focus on love alone um, being the uh, commandment from God in the New Testament. There was a time when people went to church, heard the truth, and wept over their sins. Today, people go to church, hear a motivational speech, and ignore their sins. The idea, of course, is that uh, uh, there has been a uh, a change over the last hundred years, actually, is when this took place, late in the 1800s. Uh, uh, churches begin to, uh, to focus on love as well as uh, uh, the, the commandments that uh, were given to us in the New Testament. Uh, that changed dramatically in the 60s. In the 60s and in the, in, in the early 70s, which was actually the hippie movement, uh, uh, our culture was bombarded with uh, love alone, uh, and we were taught, and we still are taught in schools, to question authority. Questioning authority is healthy for a democratic society. I remember being taught this in college. We should question authority, uh, especially the presidential authority over us. Not necessarily the professors, of course, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> this this has become uh, uh, very very common in our culture. And today, if you don't question authority, you're considered dangerous. You're considered uh, uh, wrong somehow. This is uh, it's it's like news. Listening to the news. If you don't listen to the news, there's something wrong with you. Uh, it doesn't occur to any, I, this is like the emperor's new clothes, I'm convinced. If you, if you listen to the news and, and are an avid news listener, um, you would think that it would occur to these folks at some point in time that this doesn't change their personal lives one iota. I mean, they know what's going on in Korea. They know about nuclear testing and and they're wringing their hands, and they're talking about it over their water coolers and over their cups of coffee and everything, but it doesn't change your life. Although they have this idea, culturally, I think, that it does somehow change your life. I can remember being told that if you don't listen to the news, you're living with your head in the sand like an ostrich. What's the matter with you that you're not listening to the news? You don't know what's going on in the world. What's the matter with you? And my response is, who cares? Who cares? I mean, I'm sorry for those people in Africa that don't have enough to eat, and I will pray for them that they don't have, that they, because they don't have any, but I can't do anything about that. And it doesn't change my life or the way I live at all. It's possible that it might motivate me to give to an organization that takes care of that kind of a thing. But frankly, the majority of the people that hear this kind of news don't do anything about it except talk. It's gossip fodder. News has become 100% pure entertainment, and that's all it is. And to the extent that we say, yeah, give me more, give me more, give me, oh, I'm, yeah, I gotta rush home right now and turn on the TV because the news is on. I don't want to miss the news. Uh, this is like a soap opera. What's wrong with you? <laughs> that this, is, this trumps social interaction and everything else. I've got to listen to my news. It's like saying, I got, Days of Our Lives is coming on. I, I, uh, <laughs> well, no, I guess they don't. <laughs> I just thought of that while I was saying it. Okay, so today we have a church that that has been 
severely compromised by the culture around it. Uh, I, I just said it enough. Uh, uh, the, uh, the church doesn't believe this. They don't understand this. They're oblivious to this. They think they're the one fish swimming in the opposite direction from the rest of the school. Have you seen that t-shirt? I, uh, you know, we're individuals, we stand apart, we're different from all other, no, you are exactly the same. If somebody can look at your life, not hear what you're saying, but look at your life and the way that you act and the way that you talk to people, and if they cannot distinguish you from everybody else in society, there's something wrong with you as a Christian. There is something terribly wrong with you as a Christian. Christians pray over their meals. They cover their heads. If you're a woman, they cover your heads. Or if you're a man, they take their hats off. There, there are a lot of things that make us peculiar people because we are Christians and we are commanded to do these things in the New Testament. Now, let me just say one thing about praying since I brought it up. There are a lot of rules for praying a lot of commandments given in the New Testament for praying. One of those commandments is, yes, you shall raise your hands rather than fold your hands like we were taught in Sunday school. You're raising your hands in prayer. Um, the, however, there is also a commandment that says you are not to, you know, stand on a street corner where everybody can see you and lift your eyes and hands toward heaven and say, Oh, Lord God, I thank you that I am such a wonderful... And, and go on and on and on so that you are actually praying to an audience. You, you instead, Jesus told us this, you instead go into your prayer closet and pray to the Father in secret. Secret. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't pray in public. It just means that when you pray in public... Don't stand up and, you know what I mean? It's, they're, they're, in, a, in a restaurant, you wouldn't do this anyway, but you've got to be careful. You're not praying so that other people can see you. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because I was guilty of this. There are a lot of times when I was growing up where I thought, you know what? It's a real witness for people to see me praying over my food in a restaurant. I didn't raise my hands. I didn't stand up. I didn't pray out loud or anything else, but I made it clear by my actions to all of the people around me that I was praying over my food. I thought that was very important. They should see that I'm a Christian. Prayer is not a way that we distinguish ourselves from other people. We see that, but we're supposed to be praying in secret, so don't go to extremes. You know, if you need to raise your hands, uh, you know, do it quietly and in secret. That's what Jesus told us to do. That your prayer is supposed to be strictly between you and God the Father. It is not supposed to be seen or witnessed or, worse, worse case, it is not intended to be for other people to see. Now, this doesn't preclude, it does not preclude corporate prayer. There are many examples in the New Testament where one person prayed for a large group, and that large group acknowledged and agreed in prayer with the prayer being prayed by that one individual. So I'm not saying don't pray in a corporate setting, in a church setting, for, so other people can hear what it is that you're praying. That's not what I'm saying. In a secular context, outside of the church body, don't pray publicly. That's not what prayer is about. Frankly, the more often that you do that, the more likely it becomes that your prayer becomes horizontal in nature rather than vertical. And you don't want to be guilty of praying to an audience of people around you so that they can know that you are a godly person. That's not what this is all about. And they clear in the throat real loud. If you can pray, don't, you don't have to get everybody in the restaurant to look at you because you're going to pray. You're just trying to... It's fascinating how many places we are told to keep 
what we're doing secret as opposed to doing it in front of an audience. It's like God is trying to tell us something. It's not just prayer, it's good works. Your good works are supposed to be done in secret. They're not, you're not supposed to sound the gong and say, uh, yeah. when I was in, growing up in the church, in the Baptist church and the Presbyterian church, there were a lot of times when people would give large gifts for a specific thing. I remember when uh, uh, a Presbyterian church, I won't name it because it's probably still around, um, they, they were building the sanctuary and uh, you know they would announce before the sermon that this family has donated this amount of money for a family pew in the front row. And it was going to have a brass plaque on it reserved for the such and such family. And I thought, what can they be thinking? I mean, doesn't the Bible say, I, I knew as a kid that it was, this was wrong, but I was a kid, so I didn't dare say anything. I mean, everybody was nodding their heads around, you know, and, and uh, good on them. You know, it was, it was, it was really weird, uh, but I fell into silence because I was convinced, you know, maybe they know something that I don't. No, Jesus knows more than all of those people, and Jesus is the one that told us to keep our giving, as well as our good works, as well as our prayer life, secret not just to ourselves, but secret. That's the word in the King James that's being used, secret. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. That's how secret he gave it. I mean, when you're, the, the, uh, it's, a, it's a metaphor, of course, but the idea is if you're doing something uh, for God with your right hand, hide it from your left hand. I mean, that's how secret he wants us to keep what we're doing. Nevertheless, we are to be a peculiar people, different from the culture around us. In the way that we act by the things that we believe. Now, let me give you an example. It's not because every time somebody hears that some good thing has happened to another person, we jump up and say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. That's not appropriate behavior for a Christian in the New Testament. What is appropriate is that we act different based on our system of beliefs. Our worldview is different than the rest of the world. We do not, for instance, criticize our leaders. We do not question authority. We obey the law of the land strictly and without exception so that, and I, I'm convinced that the real reason for this is so that no one can point to us and say, see, those Christians, they're disobedient to the law of the land. They think they're above the law of the land. It's an excuse that is for, for criticizing the church and Christianity and God that disappears if we obey every law of the land. So we obey every law of the land. And that way, people can say of us, What's different about these people? I mean, they're weird. What makes, a, and you're weird because you're obeying the law of the land, and they don't. The rest of society around us, folks, believes, honestly believes that if I don't get caught, that makes it okay. When you see a $20 bill laying on the sidewalk, and you walk past it, and you don't even touch it. You, you see it, everybody sees that you see it, but you don't reach out and grab it. People are likely to ask you, well, why didn't you take it? I mean, why, what's, it's, and then you have the opportunity perhaps to explain why you didn't take it. What is your reasoning for this? The questions should not come from ostentatious displays. The question should come for, why do you believe what it is that you believe? Why do you live in a culture that believes this way, and you obviously are doing good things instead of the way that the culture has taught you growing up? You're weird. You're wrong. You're difficult. Why do you have to be this way? 
not because every time you sit down at a restaurant, you raise your hands way up so everybody around you can see that you're praying. And then they ask themselves, oh my goodness, one of those. I, I know a Christian uh, Santa Claus here on the mountain that uh, uh, somebody was talking about me to him and uh, they said that he's, he's a, a pastor and uh, he speaks to groups about Santa Claus from a Christian perspective. And the pastor's comment in reply was, oh, he's one of those. The Santas. The San he wasn't a pastor. He was a Santa Claus. He's one of those. Now, the, the guy is a Christian. He goes to church every Sunday. And what he was saying was in response to the fact that here's a Santa over here that actually preaches the word of God. <clears throat> oh, he's one of those. You have to wonder what, what is behind that comment. What, what is, what's the thinking that justifies denigrating a fellow Santa, a fellow Christian, because he's preaching the word of God as Santa Claus. Now, you, you wonder these things, but it's important to understand that in the Bible, in the New Testament, over and over again, we're told that if you are persecuted, listen to what I'm saying now. We're going to get to this in the commandments. If you are persecuted in any way by the culture around you, by the people around you, for your belief in Jesus, your belief in God, if you are persecuted or you receive unjust treatment as a result of that, praise God. Because God is going to reward you for receiving unjust or persecuted treatment as a result of your faith. Now, this is an important thing to understand. We are to act not ostentatiously, not to draw attention to ourselves. In all three cases, prayer, giving, and good works, in all three cases, we are to do these things as unto the Lord not to a horizontal audience, but to a vertical audience. We're in the, in the subject of giving right now, and uh, it's important for us to understand that when we give, one of the rules is that you are to give as unto the Lord. Now, I've said this before. You've read this before. This is not news to you. If we don't give as unto the Lord, if we give to the people who we are targeting with our gifts or our good deeds or good works, we're wrong. We're wrong. The, the, the Bible specifically says to give as unto Jesus. Let's, uh, let's take just a breather from this and then I'm going to return to it when we get into it. This, this uh, um, has to do with, with pastors and their congregations. Now, I don't know if you can read the the placards on the screen there, but uh, these are, you know, there's one in the back that says, only good news. And then there's no cross next to that one. And then be relevant, that is relevant to my life and my society and the way that I live my, choose to live my life. Um, then the next row up is tell me how to get rich. Uh, then tickle my ears. If you don't do uh, if you don't do things my way, what can Jesus do for me? And then in the front row, don't mention hell. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Please refer to sin as bad choices. Tell me again how much God wants to bless me. Make sure there are enough programs for my kids. The big swing set, you know. <laughs> Remember how much money I give each week. Now, the, this is, and then, of course, the, the poor pastor standing up there. Uh, the, the idea being communicated by the comic is, you know, pastors tend to, to be dictated to. If they are meek, if they are mild, if they are servants 
uh, rather than leaders in their church, then they are not responsible for what they preach. They are preaching to an audience that demands these things. The, the question then is chicken and the egg, which came first, the chicken and the egg. Whose fault is it when a pastor preaches something that is contrary to scripture to his congregation who doesn't want to hear it? I, and this is a common problem in the church today. If I get in front of my church and I say these things just because they're in the Bible, just because God told me to say these things, if I say these things, next week, guess how many people will be sitting in the pews? How am I going to pay the light bill, let alone the mortgage on this property and the air conditioning and everything else that goes into making this church a church? Whose fault is it when people hear from the pulpit exactly what they demand to hear from the pulpit? The comic is pointing the finger at the congregation. They're the problem. And I think that that's wrong. I think that the pastor's responsibility, regardless of what the congregation wants, is to teach them scripture, to teach them what God says, not what the culture says. Anytime a pastor responds to a question by saying, well, you know, uh, uh, it's probably okay. In our culture, in our day and age, these things are fine. That's not the way a pastor should be answering the question. I've thought about this a lot, and, and I have come to the conclusion that a pastor's responsibility is to say, you don't want to know what I think. It's not important what I think. What's important is what God thinks. Let me tell you what God says on this subject. And if you don't know, promise to get back to them after you've had a chance to study it. That's a pastor's responsibility. Not to please his congregation. And I've been guilty of this too. People come to me and say things like, oh, I, I really need to know about these things. And am I doing something terribly wrong? Am I, am I going to hell? Because, and my, my first motivation is to comfort them, to give them peace about what it is that they're con so concerned about. And I realized along the way that this was not what God was trying to do for them. All I was doing was saying, it's okay. It's okay, don't worry about it, don't worry. God is forgiving. That's why Jesus went to the cross, is to make sure that you could be forgiven for these things. God is not going to forgive you unless you ask for forgiveness. It's called repentance. It is not the congregation's responsibility to raise questions that they demand specific answers to. It is the pastor's responsibility to teach the Word of God, regardless of whether the congregation wants to hear that or not. And if they decide, you know what, I don't like it here anymore, there are, there's a church on every street corner in the land. And if you don't like one, all you got to do is walk down the street to the next one. Sooner or later, you're going to find one that gives you exactly what it is that you want out of a church. But if you want Bible teaching, stick with the Bible teacher or the pastor of a church who is teaching the Word of God and it doesn't care about offering. He doesn't care about how many see how many people are sitting in the pews. That's not what's important to him. He takes his job seriously. He takes his job as a pastor more serious than he does how much money he's able to draw in on a Sunday morning by passing the offering plate. And that requires a lot of seats to be filled kind of thing. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into... Uh, the text that we're following today. Um, it's uh, just a reminder, we are doing this, uh, we're doing this from the book uh, because this is an easy way for us to review the scriptures involved. I'm not trying to substitute this book for the Bible. I am simply taking the verses that are scattered throughout the Bible on any one individual subject and concentrating them by topic. 
there are many people who own what, what's called a topical reference. That's the technical term that we use, a topical reference. Uh, there are books on, uh, uh, that are, here are all the Bible verses that have to do with, with uh, uh, loving your wife. And it's a whole book full of these things. And it's got running commentary throughout to explain what the verse is talking about. Um, some of them eschew the, the whole concept of a running commentary, and they just give you the verses. Uh, this is a, a topical reference for men. It's got a good brown cover on it, you know, instead of the topical reference for women, that's got a pink cover on it. And, and these are passages that, uh, yeah, look at... Uh, uh, Doreen's iPad cover. <laughs> the, the, the idea is that a topical reference uh, is, should be the Bible. It should be the Bible, but it should not be in scripture order. It should be in an order that provides you with an answer to a specific question. And I think there's value in that. And that's why I'm teaching topically rather than through the Bible. So with that in mind, let's uh, open iBooks on your iPad or, or whatever else you're using. And uh, in the table of contents, scroll down to Concerning Your Works and tap the first commandment under Concerning Your Works, uh, which is, you shall be judged by Christ for your works. This is new. Um, I've re-sequenced the, the uh, commandments here. So uh, we'll do this one now, and then we'll skip the next couple. Uh, because we've already done those. You shall be judged by Christ for your works. I thought that it was, it was an important thing to start out with this commandment in the list. Um, people should, should know why it's so important to do these good works. It's because you're going to be judged by these works. Um, the uh, Old Testament commentaries, uh, the Old Testament uh, context for this subject is given first. Job 31, 16 to 23. If I have withheld the poor from their desire, or if I've caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or I have eaten my morsel myself alone, and the fatherless hath not eaten thereof. For from my youth he was brought up with me, as with a father and I have guided her from my mother's womb. If I have seen any perish for wanting of clothing, or any poor without a covering, if his loins have not blessed me, and if I were not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted up my hand against the fatherless when I saw my help in the gate, then let mine arm fall from my shoulder blade and mine arm be broken from the bone. For destruction from God was a terror to me and by reason of his highness, I could not endure. This is, these are, this is phrased fairly poetically, but the, the important thing here is that even as far back as the book of Job, which by the way, most scholars believe is the actually, actually the first book ever written in scripture. Uh, it predates even the Mosaic law, Genesis through Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus and Numbers and Exodus. Uh, these, these, uh, this is the oldest book. It's, it doesn't describe the oldest things that have happened, but it is the first book that was actually penned. Um, as far back as Job, it was important to take care of the poor. Now, Jesus said, you're not going to solve poverty. Don't even bother trying to solve poverty. It, the poor will always be with you, Jesus said. Always. Guarantee. There's no way that you can solve poverty. So don't even bother with it. Your focus of attention should be on the poor. If you see a poor person, do something about it. If they are needy, do something about it. If somebody is in need and you don't do something about it, there are going to be consequences. Now, let me give you my sense of this 
This is not scripture, but just kind of this is a spoiler alert. Faith is not the same thing as belief. We've talked about this before. Faith is different from belief. Belief comes from me. Where does faith come from? Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. That means he's responsible for our faith, not me. I'm not responsible for my faith. My faith doesn't come from me. My belief does, but not my faith. My faith comes from Jesus. He's the one that creates my faith. Why is it my faith? And why is my faith different from everybody else's faith? And the answer is because it is the path that I'm walking. Jesus talks a lot about the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He talks about the, the narrow path, the hard gate and the narrow path. These are all metaphors, but they all point to pretty much the same thing. It's your faith in question. God says, and I'm, this, is, this is my take on what we're about to read. My take is that the path of faith, and faith is a path, the path that God has given me to walk as a Christian is going to be studded. It's going to be punctuated by opportunities to do good works, opportunities to give. If you ignore them or turn your face away from them because you've got your own agenda on this path, then you're no longer on the path because that opportunity will lead you to the next opportunity. The walk of faith a lot of people refer to this walk of faith. You can only walk on this path if you're doing these good deeds. If you're not doing on the if you're not walking on the path, then you're standing on the path. And that's worse than going walking down the broad path. You're stagnant. Your faith, according to the New Testament, is dead. Think about that. Your faith is dead if you are not doing good works. Furthermore, Jesus is the one who will judge us based on whether we did good works, whether we gave to the poor. This is not just, well, you know, you should, kind of, sort of, when, you, when you're feeling good about so When somebody is really destitute, then maybe you should you know, dig deep and, and give to the poor kind of a thing. No, what the Bible doesn't say is give to the church. The Bible doesn't say give to the church at all. There is no such thing as tithing in the New Testament. So we can get rid of tithing. We can get rid of passing the plate. The only reason that you give to the church is to support the pastor or the teacher over you. Not the building fund, not the maintenance staff, not any of the, nothing else. The bulk of what you give should be outside of the church, to the poor, to the needy. And the good deeds that you do are also for the poor and the needy. I'm teaching you folks. I'm more of a teacher, frankly, than a pastor when I do this. But this is not... I can no, in no way see this as a good work because I'm not doing this to, to be guilty of good works. The reason that I'm doing this is because I have to do this. Uh, Paul said the same thing, and I've talked to other pastors the same way. It's kind of an interesting thing. Once, once you have started to teach, and it doesn't matter how, quote, successful you are, unquote, you have a passion on your life and you have to teach. Even women know this. Once you've started to teach, there's a passion that kind of takes over and you, you feel the need to tell people. You need, you need to talk to people about this. kind. You need to teach. You need to pastor. Don't do it if you're a woman because the Bible says not to. You're not allowed to do these things. Another sermon, another subject. But as a man... If you are called to be a pastor, called to be a teacher, your success is in the teaching, not in how many people are listening to it. I, I sometimes get discouraged 
about this. But that's only because I'm looking horizontally rather than vertically. And in that, I'm wrong. I should be focusing vertically, just like you should. This is not about who else I'm involved with. This is not a life of social media. Christianity is not Christ-centered Facebook. It is not a horizontal or a social organization. Christianity is about vertical, not horizontal. However, even when you do good works or giving, it's supposed to be done vertically. If you see the opportunity to give, go ahead and give. Make sure that you give or do good works where necessary, but give it vertically. Do it vertically as unto the Lord, as unto the Lord. This is incredibly important. If you don't, you lose any treasure, any reward that you would have ordinarily gotten by doing it as unto the Lord. You shall be judged. Psalm 62, 12. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou